everyone, and welcome to the uh, to the twenty <laughs> to the twenty second OVC Animal uh, Welfare Forum. Uh, Darren and I, Irene, are the co presidents for the OVC Animal Welfare Club. Um, it's a veterinary student organization running this event each year. Uh, beyond education, one very important goal of our forum is to raise funds towards the Carathon Animal Welfare Research Scholarship. Each year, the scholarship is awarded to a graduate student studying animal welfare. Thank you uh, to your support um, for the forum uh, and attending it each year. Uh, our club had the privilege of funding the scholarship over, 20, over the last 20 years, thanks to you. Uh, and a special thank you for those uh, who made a donation when you registered for today's forum. And yeah, so we'd just like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the club's faculty, Dr. Derek Haley and Dr. Lee Neal. Um, thank you for your continuous support and uh, leadership. So just before we start and let Temple take over, um, we have just a couple of housekeeping things. So it's being recorded and will be posted online. Um, and you guys are all muted just to um, avoid some interruptions, but the chat will be open. Um, and you're welcome to submit questions there and Temple will, will see them as it comes through. And yeah, so I'd just like to invite Cassandra, the club's incoming co-president, uh, to welcome our special guest today. Hey, hi everyone. As Darren mentioned, I'm Cassandra and I'm one of the vice co-presidents of the club, uh, along with Julie, who will be closing our session. Uh, we do have until 1.30 today and Temple will do her best to answer some of your questions throughout the lecture, but we'll also try to leave some time at the end for some more Q&A. For our first forum talk today, um, as you all know, it's being presented by Temple Grandin, who is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. The facilities she has designed for handling livestock are used by many companies around the world. She also has been instrumental in implementing uh, animal welfare auditing programs that are used by companies such as McDonald's, Wendy's, Whole Foods, uh, and other corporations. Professor Grandin has appeared on numerous TV shows such as 2020, Larry King Live, and Primetime. Her books include Thinking in Pictures, Livestock Handling and Transport, and The Autistic Brain. Her book Animals in Translation has also been on the New York Times bestseller list. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, it's great to be here today. A lot of things to talk about. I think I'll start out talking about some of my work with auditing animal welfare because I get asked all the time, what are some of the things I'm the most proud of? Well, the thing that I did, and this was something I did about 25 years ago that made some of the biggest difference in animal welfare was a very simple auditing protocol that I developed for meat packing plants. And I wrote a bunch of papers on it, uh, Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, Applied Animal Behavior Science, going from 1998 up through 2005. And the first, one of the reasons why it worked really well, it was extremely simple. You have to figure out what are the most important things to measure. And this was for slaughterhouses. So of course I'm gonna measure stunning efficacy. How many animals were stunned correctly and made unconscious with a single application of the stunner? You know, all of the, making sure all the animals are dead when they're hanging on the rail. Then I measured some handling measurements like falling down electric pride use. But there's a measurement that I found that worked really well for cattle at the, uh, when they're being handled was vocalization. And I found that about 98% of the vocalizations in the stun box or right around in that area were associated with an adversive event such as electric prodding. And if you're to pass an audit, you had to have a 3% level of vocalization. And if you had something really wrong, like squeezing an animal too hard with a restraint device, that vocalization score could get up to 30% or 40%. So it could really tell you if something bad was going on. Very, very simple. The big problem I'm seeing now is things getting way too complicated. There's a big difference between an assessment tool we use for research and assessment tool that we can use very successfully out in industry. We have a day and a half workshop to train people. And then they get, you know, three to five, you know, shadow audits uh, done with other people to learn. But if it's not simple, you can't do it industry-wide. The other thing that made this program extremely successful in improving how slaughter plants operated was I was hired by McDonald's. This is back in 1999 
to implement this program and train their food safety auditors how to do this. And at first they were a bit skeptical, but then when they saw some of the great changes that were happening, they um, immediately um, got really interested in it. Big buyers drive change. This is where I learned where if I wanna bring about change, gotta work with big buyers. Another very interesting thing that happened was animal welfare went from an abstraction that you delegate the lawyers, you delegate it to um, uh, the PR people, to something real. Because I took high up level executives on their first uh, tours of farms and slaughter plants. And when they saw something bad, they go, oh, we've got to get out and actually fix something. It was just like that show Undercover Boss. You see something bad, you're going to um, do something about it. And what started out is just a little auditor training program morphed into a big industry changing event. And then about 10 years later, PACO, Professional Animal Auditors Certification Organization was formed, you know, to make a more formal uh, training. First of all, starting out with the slaughterhouse audit. So we applied this to 75 McDonald's suppliers in the US. And what was interesting is, is that out of those 75 plants, only three had to put in expensive new equipment to uh, pass an audit. Stunning, your number one problem was maintenance of equipment. They, in high traffic areas like stun boxes, we had to put in non-slip flooring. Training, getting electric prods out of people's hands, really super important thing to do. Um, and only three places had to put something in that was expensive. Now, one of the reasons why this was successful is I bent over backwards to not force anybody to put in expensive equipment. There were three places out of 75 that had to put it in. But I was amazed how repairs, simple changes like a light on the entrance of a chute or moving a, a, moving a light to make a reflection go away, put up a solid panel so they wouldn't see people walking by could greatly improve handling. Uh, and then also three plant managers had to be removed. Uh, they just didn't have the right attitude. And I've discussed these, um, these systems in detail. Um, I've got a new book out called The Slaughter of Farm Animals, talks about how to do these audits. Um, to have a successful auditing program, there's three legs on a tripod. You have a third party independent company go out and audit. You have the plant do or, or farm do internal audits. And then you've got to have the managers of the corporation, the buyers go out and look at stuff. I call it get the suits out of the office. They've got to get out. And when there's, there's been places where there's been very severe, really bad um, you know, supply chain horribleness in industries like pharmaceuticals and clothing, this happened when the suits didn't get out of the office and do the third leg of the audits. So getting really good, simple auditing tools is really important. So we got things working really great at the slaughterhouses. I'm not gonna call them harvest plants. And then about 10 years later, we started having some problems with beta agonists making cattle lame when it was a high doses. But now, right now, we've got some problems with lame cattle and lame pigs, which is strictly leg confirmation. They're either too straight like this, or the ankles are collapsed, or they are twisted. And this is breeding. When you just single-mindedly breed for production traits, you're going to end up um, kind of shortchanging the skeleton. And I've seen the same leg defects in both cattle and in pigs. In order to have good welfare during handling, whether it's on the farm or at a meat packing plant or in a stockyard, you have to have animals that can walk. Talk about a basic behavior. Walking is a very, very basic behavior. And there's some pigs and cattle that are having problems with that. Now, as we've bred for more and more meat and milk, we're starting to get some other problems, which 10 years ago, we did not have. I've been in this industry for 50 years, 50 years now. And 10 years ago, we started having heart attacks and congestive heart failure and big, heavy, late stage feedlot cattle. We did not have that before. So, an issue that I'm getting really, really concerned about is what I call biological system overload. And this is when you breed an animal or feed an animal where you push the biology just too hard. 
The bulldog would be another example. Can't breathe, can't walk, can't have his babies naturally. And you want to see something really disgusting. There's, a, uh, there's an auditing chart for nasal stenosis in the bulldog. And the bulldog that can hardly breathe at all, his no, nose holes are about that big. How do we get into a mess like that? So now we have a scorecard for you know, whether or not bulldogs can breathe. I think it's good that, um, that that's been done. Here's a good question here. You said big buyers drive change in animal ag. What's the parallel in companion animal world? And we've got some you know, bad situations. The bulldog, we've got some very bad situations with dog breeding. This is something that needs to change. And I was very disturbed just a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a surf on the internet, found out that French bulldogs were a real popular dog in the UK. And guess who's buying them? Young people, young people are buying them. And they're just clueless that these animals have got a big welfare issue. Now I'm very pleased in the veterinary profession that things such as fear-free are now uh, becoming popular. Well, let's make the dog's visit to the vet clinic positive. And then the dog's going to be willing to go to the vet clinic and not putting his tail between his legs because it doesn't want to go to the vet clinic. It's real important to make an animal's first experience with something new a good first experience. That applies to introducing a horse to a horse trailer or going to the vet clinic. So maybe the first visit is you just feed them some treats. Now, there's also some real obvious things that people have overlooked. Non-slip flooring. It's essential for livestock when you're handling them. It's also essential for a dog on an exam table. You go online and you look up cute puppies on at the vet clinic and you're gonna see dogs in the brace position like this because of the fear of falling. And I, I suggest, why don't you just have your clients go down to Walmart and buy a bath mat with the rubber backing. Get your puppy used to that. Then, you, then the client comes in, puts the bath mat on the table, and we have a non-slip surface that you don't have to wash or do anything with. The client can take it home. Very, very, very simple thing you can do. Let's give that animal a non-slip surface to stand on. Real, real simple thing. The other thing we could do is to train puppies to tolerate some of the hard touch that a veterinarian has to do. We're going to hold the head up here like this, or you know, hold the paw off the nail trims. You can teach puppies, you know, with treats, you know, that to, to tolerate, you know, that kind of touching. But I think sometimes uh, some veterinarians don't realize they're getting a dog in a situation where um, it's really going to make a lot of fear. I went into a clinic and I saw a really bad situation where they had a large dog that they were getting ready for anesthesia. Three people were manhandling the dog. Well, meanwhile, three dogs and a couple of cats were watching this whole thing from the cages. I don't think having other dogs watch people manhandle another dog is a really good thing to do. Now let's start working on getting animals to voluntarily cooperate. There's been some very nice research in livestock on the importance of stockmanship, on, on acclimating cattle to walking through handling facilities, then feeding them some treats. Well, we could be doing some of these same things with pets. Um, fear. It's a very strong stressor. I wrote a paper a good number of years ago called Assessment of Stress During Handling and Transport. And it was the very first paper, which came out in 1997, that put the fear word in the animal science literature. That fear word had been in the, uh, uh, in the neuroscience literature for decades, but now I got it into animal science and presented some of that research. And now people are finally recognizing that animals actually do have emotions. I'm a very big fan of the Jack Panskep seven emotional systems. There's fear, then there's anger, then there's separation stress. And fear and separation distress, they're two different things. So you got the dog home alone, tearing up the house, that's separation distress, that's not fear. And then you have seek the urge to explore. One dog, all it wants to do is chase the ball. Another Labrador, same breed, just wants to lay around and is not interested in chasing the ball. One's a high seek, one's a low seek. And then of course you have the sex drive. You've got mother young nurturing, licking, mutual grooming of animals. And then you've got play. Yes, they definitely have emotions. That is very well scientifically documented. And I've noticed an interesting thing in the research literature. 
now seeing the word personality actually showing up in some farm animal papers. And the seek trait is, uh, they're calling it exploration. It'd be the same thing. Um, and then of course you have fear, that's fear. But sometimes in the animal personality literature, that's gonna be bold and shy. Now, finally, before we turn everything over to questions, I wanna talk about the future of meat. I have been involved in the livestock industry for a long, long time. And we got a lot of people bashing me. We've got all of these meat substitutes out there. Uh, and you've got to remember that for a vegetarian burger, there's a lot of different ingredients there. Each one has a different supply chain. Is it as sustainable as they say it is? Some of them are GMOs. So I've been thinking about, is livestock gonna become obsolete? Well, I got to thinking, I got to reading, also, I'm one of these flyers who actually looks out the window of an airplane. It's amazing what you can see on the ground, especially if you've been on that ground. And I know what I'm looking at from 39,000 feet. I was on a super interesting flight just the other day, Seattle to Atlanta, diagonal across the US. I've never done that before. And you come out of Seattle and, I, and the plane had the map app. So I was able to um, you know, actually see where the plane went. And you go over these kind of badlands. Uh, there's a whole lot of really gnarly country just in Washington state that what can you do with that country grazing? I've been to the Australian outback. It's half the size of the US. There's only one way to raise food on that country and that's grazing. Grazing lions are maybe 30 or 40% of the world. And you know there may be 25% of that grazing is the only thing you could do on that land. So what do we do, not raise food on it? I think in the future, the grazing animal, cattle, sheep, goats, they got a good future, but we've got to do them right. I did some internet surfing just the other night and I read about wrecked pastures and they had to kick all the livestock off. Now they're starting to put them back on again it's in another country. Um, yeah, you have to do grazing right because if you do grazing wrong, it wrecks land. But if you do grazing right, it actually improves land. I'm also really like the idea of doing grazing over a cover crop every third year for your soy and um, for in with the soy and corn rotation. Because if we use these animals right, they improve land. That's the thing. We can use grazing animals to improve land. I'm getting really interested in this because I've had animal rights people bash me as the evil slaughterhouse designer. So when I get bashed as the evil slaughterhouse designer, um, it's made me really, really think. And um, I think grazing animals have got a good future. But we've got to use them right. Local conditions are really going to vary. And what I'd like to now do is just open it up for questions. And you can put them in the chat. And uh, no, I think it's good just to answer that question in the chat. Things like the fear-free movement, I think that's really good. Lots of traits. Um, you know, it's good that these, you know, people are starting to do this, recognizing that, you know, well, okay, if the pet doesn't want to go to the vet clinic, it's due to fear. And that's the number one question a lot of clients ask. A year ago, I did a big Zoom call with a, with a San Francisco uh, Humane Society, and they had a weird chat. The chat was all messed up, and the audience couldn't see the chat. So they kept asking the same questions because they couldn't see them. I could see them. The number one question is, my dog is afraid of the bat. That was the number one question. That's a year ago. That's recent. 400 some people on this call. The second question was the uh, afraid of uh, thunder and all kinds of stuff like that. And then the um, separation distress, tearing up the house issue. Future of zoos. I've done some work with zoos and I uh, did some back in the 90s. And we trained antelopes to uh, tolerate um, uh, and voluntarily cooperate with getting injections and uh, blood draws. Um, nobody thought we could train them, but we did. And, and then veterinary procedures become time for treats, not torture time. I'll tell you one thing we learned. The veterinarian who had shot them with the dart gun could never work with them. And that's not in the paper because he was one of the authors, but that's something that we learned. Um, some animals adapt to zoos a lot better than others. Elephants, real problematic. I remember going to a uh, uh, backstage in a zoo, a really nice zoo. Um, 
about five years ago. They really loved their elephants. They treated them so well. But I'm looking at this facility and I'm going, it's a prison. I, but on the other hand, a lot of the small animals are just fine in the zoo. They, they adapt to it just fine. Because I think it's important on, you know, for kids to see the real thing. I'm very concerned today. We have a generation of students totally removed from the world of the practical. I had a long discussion just before I got on this Zoom call about a student um, just, uh, why does she have to ask so many questions about a blood testing tube? And then one of our other professors, we were talking the other day about students that can't seem to figure out lab equipment. And I think some of this is due to they're growing up just on electronic devices. They don't do anything practical. I had a student last semester who had never used a ruler to measure anything. Had a lot of trouble with my scale drawing. And I think we need to get students back and kids back to doing real things. I think they need some real, uh, see some real animals and let's use animals that, that uh, adapt well to the zoo. Yeah, basically, okay, Netson just said, I like this question. I know you're thoughtful about critics. How do you respond to evil slaughterhouse designer? Are you saying we need cattle for land conservation so you're providing a good death? Well, yes, um, but I've also just made me really think about, okay, environmentally, they say that you know, livestock wreck the environment and there are issues, methane's one, but so are leaking gas wells, so are leaking oil wells. And I have researched oil wells. Oil wells and cattle are just about the same from that thing. And you know what's easier to fix? Oil wells, they're really easy to fix. And from the onion standpoint, there's this wonderful satellite that can see the methane coming out and I can buy their pictures. So I can audit it. Well, I'm gonna start on that first because it's so easy to, they're really, really easy to fix. Um, but we have certain land where animals are part of the land. The best crop land in the US was created by herds of bison. And we need the grazing animals with soil health. And then we can work in some chicken manure too. I think that can be really good. Um, no, and we've got to give them a good death and we've got to give them a good life. We've got to make sure our grazing animals aren't getting too skinny. I've been out on the outback. I saw some really skinny cattle. They were real, real helpful, real, real healthy but they were very skinny. Now, I think if they gotten any skinnier, maybe their welfare would have, been, um, would have been compromised. But it's been making me do a lot of thinking. Now, they, now the thing with the fear-free vet visits and money, okay, there's a, there, in some of those programs, there's been a lot of emphasis on fancy decor at the vet clinic. That's where I don't put my emphasis because when I fixed the slaughterhouses, we took some shabby old dumps and with just a little bit of repairs uh, and nonstop flooring, we got them working fine. Yeah, I'd rather have a nice new facility. The thing I have found is people want the magic thing more than they want the management. And I'm gonna do the same approach with reducing fear at the vet clinic. Okay, my idea with the Walmart bath mat, that, that's not gonna cost you anything because you're gonna get the client to buy that. And that right there is gonna really help. Um, you know, I think there's some marketing stuff with, okay, fancy decor in the vet clinic. That's not, I mean, my main focus, non-slip flooring. I also would like to start teaching clients how to teach puppies to tolerate having the paw held, you know, having the paws manipulated so nail trims are easy. That's going to take some time training the puppy. That's not expensive. See, the, these are things where it's a, where it's a management thing. The thing I've learned is people want the magical new thing more than they want the, mag the, ma the, the management. When I was in my 20s, I thought I could build magical self-managing cattle handling facilities. No, you can't. Some of the worst torture I ever saw was during startup and brand new equipment. Equipment does not replace management. And I think it's a lot of it's with the vet clinic. The bath mat thing, working on training clients to you know, teach the puppy to tolerate having a paw held for traits and then the nail trim is not going to be you know, horrible um, and let's start with simple strategies like the bath mat and, and training puppies not a remodel of the vet clinic 
Okay, I went into another vet clinic, their lobby, skating rink slick, skating rink. Okay, I can tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go down to the industrial supply store or go on Uline. I get these Uline catalogs and there's a plastic runner you can buy. And I would just put some of those down on the floor and the large breeds could walk to the counter and to in the clinic on the, that. That's what I would do for that vet clinic. And of course, I was building a new clinic. I'm not going to put a skating rink in for floor for a new clinic. Okay, um, here's somebody working the dairy. Okay, let's talk about the welfare of the farming. Okay, now the OIE is moving towards what they call animal-based outcome measures. Okay, let's take the dairy kelp, for example. Lameness is a big issue. Okay, that's one of the things that we can measure. There's certain things I consider critical control points. This is my welfare book, Improving Animal Welfare, a practical approach. And, and there's certain really important animal-based indicators that need to be in it. Let's say we'll take dairy, for example, that need to be um, done for dairy cows. Lameness would be big number one. And then another one would be hawk, uh, swollen hawks. We can measure that. There's scorecards for that. My student, Wendy Fulwider, did a paper on that in 2007. Got a very simple scoring system. Normal, hair loss, uh, swelling smaller than a baseball on the worst leg, and a swelling bigger than a baseball on the, uh, on the worst leg. A four-point scoring system. Very, very simple. Okay, and for people that don't know about baseball, I'll give you the metric measurements for that. Um, so I'm going to measure... Uh, injuries to the hawks, lameness. Another thing I'm going to measure in a dairy is dirty animals. You know, the hygiene of the animals. Simple things to measure. If, the, if they're totally inside mechanical building, I'm going to measure ammonia levels. Now that is an input measure, super important one. The safety standard for people is 25 parts per million. For the animals, it needs to be a lot lower. I can measure ammonia levels. Uh, another thing we need to be looking at in cattle, we're having some problems with this in beef cattle, is heat stress. Easy to measure, easy. When cattle are at rest, when they're resting, they should breathe with the mouth closed, period. Or if they're just standing, that mouth needs to be closed. I'm not talking about after you've handled them. They're just in a feed yard pen and that mouth is open when they're breathing, they're hot. And then as the tongue comes out, they're getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it gets like just a line like that on the graph. So that's simple stuff I can measure. And then I can also measure for, you know, behavioral abnormalities. But to prevent suffering, I need to be measuring those things. And then, of course, there's handling measures. And that'd be very, very similar to the, to the meat plant. Uh, but I'm going to add uh, head gate catching as one of them. Um, are they caught correctly in the head gate or stuck halfway through it? I can measure that. Um, the other thing is that helped me make change is when I did something successful, I wrote about it. Starting off as on my cattle handling project, I wrote about them. And you write about something that's successful. All right, let's say there's a veterinary clinic that's done some really simple fear-free things and they've seen some great changes. Let's write about that veterinary clinic. Write about it. Okay, another thing in animal welfare I need to talk about is reducing suffering is not sufficient. I mean, the first thing, let's say I'm running a supply chain. I'm, I'm buying for Costco, or I'm buying for McDonald's, or I'm buying dairy products. The first thing I got to do is make sure that something really terrible is not going on. That would look really bad if it showed up on this. Um, look, everybody, high powered video game, uh, no video camera in that pocket. I got to make sure the acts of abuse are not happening. Then my basic things to prevent suffering are things like lameness measurements, um, hot scores, heat stress, ammonia levels, you know, things like that. Uh, then the next thing I need to be uh, measuring, and it's the things that um, a lot of work's been done at Guelph on, highly motivated behavioral needs, like a nest box for laying hen, for example. Then. Right now, you've got David Malore talking about the five domains, positive emotions. Does the animal actually have positive experiences? Now, I think visually, 
So I can see the dairy cow just loving that rotary brush, the motorized rotary brush. I'm not supposed to say she's loving it, but she does. And out in British Columbia, they've done some very nice research that shows that cows are highly, highly, highly motivated to use these brushes. Um, then some other, so I've got to prevent suffering. And that's what your basic animal-based outcome measures do. And you have to remember the OIE is making, is making welfare standards for the entire world. And all like 200 some countries have to sign off on it. And everybody can agree that lameness is something that needs to be measured. It's a major, major issue. But preventing suffering is not enough. Do our farm animals actually have some positive experiences? Okay, here's the issue about the financial value. All right, veterinarian, how about your employee insurance on dog bites? And if you put in uh, really good fear-free type of practices, that uh, you're probably going to reduce dog bites. That's going to uh, th that that's financial incentive right there. Cat bites are worse. You know, how about uh, some IV antibiotics after you've had a cat bite? And while then that, see, I think associate. Now let me tell you about a super cool little experiment that was done with cats. All right, which cat's most likely to bite and scratch the bat? This is a little experiment done over in the UK, which never got published. The student never published it. Big mistake. Got the records from a cat clinic, and she found that an indoor cat was more likely to bite or scratch at the vet hospital than an outdoor cat. And I and this tells me something. I think the problem is that indoor cat doesn't get exposed to enough stuff. So when she sees the first dog, she goes completely berserk. A lot of animals today are afraid of a lot of stuff because they um, don't get exposed to enough things. And um, well, you know, fear free for large animals. Um, let's train. Well, one of the things you can do is you acclimate your cattle to handling, but they're not gonna like going through the handling facilities 10 times. So, um, you got to give them some traits, got to reward them. And, and doing these kinds of things, uh, and it does pay. One of the ways I used to sell equipment back in the 80s, you know how I sold equipment? Oh, I collected all the horrible workman's comp claim accidents. I made sure I told people about them. And that's a financial incentive right there. Well, the methane, um, uh, this question came up about dealing with the greenhouse gases. Um, see, green, see, methane is uh, really bad, but it's short-lived. CO2 isn't as bad, but it never goes away. And your biggest carbon emitter is power plants. Power plants, transportation second. Yep, and then cattle do put out methane. They do. Um, but you got to remember, wildlife put it out too. Ruminant wildlife also put out methane. Elk and bison, and moose, and deer, they put it out too. And there's always a, the, another place that puts out a ton of methane, and nobody's suggesting destroying this, is wetlands. Wetlands are good for the environment, and they put out a ton of methane. Oh, let me tell you this new satellite data. Oh, man, I love satellites. Because I like things where I can audit something and they cannot cheat. And the oil well fixing. Oil wells and cattle are about the same. Oil wells are very, very easy to fix. Because the problems with methane coming out of an oil well is lack of maintenance. Same problem that we had with fixing the slaughterhouses. Okay, now maybe some people could ask some verbal questions. Come on, somebody here's got to talk. Turn the microphone on and talk. I'm kind of scrolling through the messages here. Uh, yeah, I had one, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. Um, so clearly, it, it's a little bit outside of um, our veterinary focus today, but clearly you're a huge advocate for animal welfare, but you're also a huge advocate for um, the autistic community. So I was just wondering, do you think there are a lot of parallels between advocating for animals and advocating for 
a human minority? Like, did did one help you do the uh, a better job of the other? A lot of the principles for advocacy are the same. Writing, I've done a lot of writing. Did my first dip bat project. I wrote about it in the local magazine. I wrote about it in the national magazine. A lot of things are the same. Also, there's a lot of people that are dyslexic, ADHD, or autistic who are extremely good with working with animals. They, I'm an extreme visual thinker. I can't do algebra. So, you know, I couldn't get into vet school. I wanted to do aerospace. I couldn't do that. I can't pass algebra. I wouldn't even graduate from high school today. I'm very concerned that visual thinkers are getting screened out. And verbal thinkers are very abstract in how they approach problems, like something like climate change, for example. And, and then you have your math thinkers. So there's scientific research that shows there are visual thinkers like me, object visualizers. You can actually look this up. This is the key word, object visualizer. Then they are the visual spatial mathematicians who think in patterns, often good at music. Then there's a the word thinkers. And what I've been learning about verbal thinkers is they talk about all of these abstractions, but how do we actually do something? I saw a chart published in Chemical and Engineering News just yesterday. The, uh, on the methane, well, I'm going to pick off the oil wells, not because I'm in the cattle industry, but I know enough about equipment that those oil wells are easy to fix, easy to fix, easy to monitor. And that's the low hanging fruit. It's easy. You see, and as a visual thinker, I, um, I've got to, I, I want to look at thing, things I can get my head around. And, and I, well, that's one little methane mess that we can go out and do your maintenance and I can stop it. It's a maintenance issue. Uh, the, um, And we've got their thing on good citizen dogs and we get into issues like doggies on airplanes. I've been involved in that. Um, I can tell you, well, let's talk about doggies on airplanes. I don't really want the dogs in the cargo hold. I fly on a lot of flights. I've seen a lot of dogs on planes, a lot of dogs in airplanes, non-issue, non-issue. And then somebody brings a dog onto an airplane and it rips another passenger's face off. And then we got into a breed band, Delta Airlines. It's public knowledge. Well, who, that just wrecks it for everybody. Well, the big thing on the dogs in the cargo hold is people underestimated fear. I was on a committee in my basement. I've got a binder, big binder. It's like this thick. It's full of records from an airline. I can't tell you how I got it, but I got it. You can go on the Department of Transportation records and you can find the dead dogs. And one thing clue that I found on that is why were they dying on the second flight when they had a connection? Then I got into the binder. I'll tell you all the DOT uh, uh, records were in there, but it also had where dogs got injured, where that was a real bad thing. It was a complaint to the airline and some veterinary attention. And I'm thinking how much of this is fear? So I'm finding a record that says bloody mouth and bloody paws. What do you think the dog was doing? It was trying to dig its way out of the crate. Fear, about 20 to 30% of those records, I put a big F on them for fear. And nobody else on that committee, and there was a bunch of veterinarians on that committee who were pet veterinarians. Nobody else thought about fear. Yeah, it's the black hole of horribleness. See, now, I'm re now just before COVID happened, I went on a flight and I got a window seat and I could watch them load a dog. Got a perfect front row seat for that. And they very carefully check the ID, three different scanners, check the tag, to make sure it's right. This dog gets halfway up the conveyor. It's spinning like this. It knows where it's going. It's going in a black hole of horribleness. And I'd rather not put them in a car to hold. Let's let them ride in a passenger cabin. But they got to behave. So I'm kind of sympathetic if there are a few fake vests. But don't bring a dog on a plane that bites another passenger in the face. And if your dog craps in first class, please clean it up. Now, and then the next passenger comes in, gets his phone charger in it and his shoe, and then he photographs that, and puts it up on Facebook. Yeah, those kind of stupid things spoil it for everybody. Okay, now let's look. Let's talk about an audit for the five domains. 
I've been thinking about that. First of all, the five domains is based on European welfare quality. And often welfare quality doesn't get enough credit for that. Welfare quality is good, good feeding. Well, nutrition and good feeding, that's the same thing. Then welfare quality is good housing. Okay, the environment. Okay, even if they're out on pasture, that's, uh, you know, that's where they're housed. Then you have uh, good, uh, good health. That's the same. And then appropriate behavior and welfare quality. And then you've got behavior. Then you've got the fifth domain, which is affective. And you've got both positive and negative emotions there. Now, this is where we get into some gnarly stuff. Okay, the nutrition stuff, that's, that's straightforward. Now, I would put body condition score under that. Uh, some, of the way, some of the papers online, I think some of them are complicated stuff. Because I'm working with a client right now who's implementing the five domains. And it's gotten into a complicated mess. I think putting castration under health doesn't make very much sense because that's pain. You see, basically they say you've got to measure the, the uh, four domains, the ones that are off of welfare quality. And then you don't actually measure the fifth, you can't really measure the fifth domain. But there are measures, they're not direct measures, but we can measure things like behavior, cortisol levels as, as an indicator that an animal's got pain. I'd be just putting those in the fifth domain, what I would do. But I just listened to a seminar on this. And they said, well, that's wrong. Handling, okay, where am I going to put handling? Well, slippery floor in the facility, yeah, that could be environment. But then the handling measurements would go in behavior because they've also added in the behavior section interactions with people. But some of this is getting too complicated. And I want to make sure that our regular, simple critical control points uh, always get lots of uh, uh, emphasis. Okay, if I'm auditing a dairy and it's got 30% lame dairy cows, I don't care how they score on something, anything else, they need to flunk an audit. And that was the approach, and, approach that we took with the McDonald's audits. They had to pass on all five things, insensibility, unconsciousness, stunning efficacy, vocalization, pride use, and uh, 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 the falling down. You had to get a passing score on all five of those. Worked, worked great. And I'm worried about things getting just too complicated. Okay, somebody asked here about the um, Temple Grand and Writing Center. It's going great. Open, filled up instantly. And there's another writing center being constructed right now in Denver. There's huge demand for therapeutic writing. It's going just great, wonderful. Okay, now here's a question about the Australian outback and live export. Okay. When I first got involved in this situation, my knee-jerk response was ban it. And then I had a chance to go to the Australian outback to fly over it, look at its vastness. What do we do with this land? And a good number of those cattle are going to Indonesia. And what needs to be done is the Australians need to manage the slaughter facilities in Indonesia. It's just that simple. They've got to manage the supply chain. You see, these, these are things where often there's no simple answer. My first response when I saw some of the horrible videos, videos was ban it. Then I go to Indonesia. In the middle of the night, they took me out to this real dump and they managed to do a decent job. They had a decent stunner because these cattle are real, real tame. You just need to have a really good stunner and non-slip floor. So it is, you can have some fairly primitive facilities and, and do things right. Um, but these are, there's very serious questions here about land use, raising food. Um, the other problem I've got, and I looked into this, is if I send the meat over to Indonesia, how do I get the refrigerated shipping containers back? That are very expensive. I've got no backhaul. I only got one backhaul. Palm oil. That's a horrible product from a sustainability standpoint. I'd have to fill those boxes up full of palm oil. No, I went and I looked up what I could use for backhauls. So I didn't have to ship a bunch of empty boxes back. No, we have to make sure. But I think there's some really big issues. Do we not raise food on this land? No, we've got to make sure the welfare is good of uh, uh, the cattle, the mama cows out there in the outback, 
we got to make sure that when the babies go over to Indonesia, they're treated decently. And they had some feedlots over there, indoor feedlots. And I, that things can range from you know terrible to really good. It's got to be managed. And the only way to manage that is the Australians have to take the supply chain over, run the entire supply chain. That's the only way to fix it. Get those suits out of the office and they're going to have to see what they've got to control the supply chain. You know, the livestock export thing, it's, um, it's a gnarly issue because some of those sheep come off the outback. Now the Japanese, they ship refrigerated meat to Japan. They pay a fortune for that meat. Well, there's plenty of backhauls. Yeah, you can fill that container up full of iPhones, tons of backhauls. See, I don't think about this abstractly. I say refrigerated shipping container, I see one. I say regular shipping container, I see one. Oh yeah, $25,000 on the spot market right now for just a regular container box. Now, but we need to get people out there. We've got to figure out some pr practical stuff we can do. I'm very concerned we've got students today totally removed from the practical, it's all abstract. Okay, we've got some terrible problems. How do we actually fix some stuff? The shipping conditions to the Mideast, that's been a lot of, there's been more problems, there's more problems with that. The shipping to the Mideast is a much bigger problem than Indonesia. Indonesia is not that far. Also, ship, sheep have more welfare issues than cattle do. No, the thing is there, and then, you know, then you get into the issue of the religious slaughter. That's uh, gnarly, that, that's a complicated issue. Another issue you get into is you might be in a place where you've got facilities that work really well with tame animals and they work absolutely horrible with wild sheep or wild cattle. See, because in, 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 in Indonesia, for example, all the cattle are really tame. They can lead them around. You know, the cattle off the Australian outback, you're not going to lead them around. Well, we, we have about 10 minutes left. All right. Well, I was wondering, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate some more about um, on the topic of religious slaughter. It, it had been <coughs> on our minds lately that. a lot. Well, I've worked on that issue. And in the US, there's basically, it's exempt from all the regulations. It's legal in the US to hang them up by the ankle. And in the 80s, I spent a lot of time tearing those systems out and replacing them with better systems. And so let's look at the different parts of this. The first issue is restraint. How do I hold my aunt? And before I can really judge the other part of it, I got to fix the issue of restraint, and I did that. And you can go and look at uh, American Veterinary Medical Association. I did an uh, article, I think it was 1993, right around there, on, on euthanasia and slaughter of animals. And I described experiences I had with custom-built restraint bots, custom-built the my specs with, um, uh, I operated the box, I had all the handling fixed at the plant. Nobody was using electric prods and stuff. And we had the best rabbi in the industry. So what I had done is I'd separated the variable of reaction from the restrainer, because now I could restrain them really nicely, calmly, from reaction to the throat cut. So you have two issues here with the throat cut. Does it hurt? It's the first issue. And the second issue is how long does it take it to go unconscious? See, if you use a captive bolt or electricity, unconsciousness is instantaneous, but that's not true with a religious slaughter. If you use really good method, uh, the cattle, most cattle will pass out within 30 seconds. You use sloppy method, um, it can be prolonged. Sheep will, will uh, lose consciousness quicker than cattle do. That's due to differences in the anatomy. Now, the thing that kind of blew my mind is I was operating the box and I also have a description of it in my book, Thinking in Pictures is that when the really good rabbi, his name was Moshe, cut him, 
the cattle didn't appear to react to it. But if I went up like this in the cattle's face in their flight zone, you'd have a much bigger reaction. But in this situation, it was perfect conditions. Custom built box, really good controls. I could really control the pressure. I was running the box. I had all the handling under control and we had the best rabbi in the industry. Now, the problem is, is when things get sloppy, things go bad really, really quickly, live animals running around the plant. I've seen that. Now, in the Jewish slaughter, they have very strict rules about a special knife, a special very long straight razor knife. That makes a difference. See, in Halal, they, um, they just say a sharp knife. They don't have all the specifications. And I've seen some Halal where they were using a knife as dull as a butter knife. That was completely horrible. Now, fortunately in Halal, they're often a lot more flexible about allowing um, uh, stunning, pre-slaughter stunning. They wanna make sure that the animal dies from a knife, not from the, the uh, stunning method. Now, if you just shoot cattle with a captive bolt and you don't bleed them, they'll, they'll uh, heart will beat for several minutes. Well, then it's dying by the knife. And so for the Halal, if they'll accept stunning, great. In Australia, they're doing halal with a head only electrical that's fully reversible. And the cattle can get up and graze again. And so that's what they're doing there. But in the really Orthodox Jewish clat kosher, they won't allow stunning. Um, so I was in a situation where I had to try to figure out how to improve it. And under perfect conditions with kosher slaughter, I can say the welfare is acceptable. But as soon as anything gets sloppy, problems with a restraint device, uh, handling and roughing them up, anything like that going wrong, uh, then things deteriorate real, real quick. That's the problem. Depopulation practices, so the whole ventilation shutdown thing. And you may have read the paper about the heat and humidity process. Well, just turning the ventilation off at a farm is obviously not acceptable, totally not acceptable. And I'm um, trying to shoot all these animals with guns or captive bolts of mess. I worked with Ruth Woolley during the lockdown and we made a euthanasia trailer with an electric stunner on it, on a gooseneck trailer. And Ruth has done some experimentation with it. It works. That's the way to go using like an electric stunning, just similar as a slaughter plant. My old patent, was expired patent was put in that. And I'm, I have no financial interest in that. I worked on it for free. It was a local shop uh, that built it. And I actually was going over there during the lockdown because that was essential work. Uh, now this heat and humidity thing, I saw a video of that. And if it's done absolutely right, absolutely right. The um, pigs didn't have much of a reaction. But I know enough about engineering to know that to do that process absolutely right, requires too much en uh, engineering expertise that's beyond your average veterinarian or average pig farmer. You know, I do not recommend it. It requires too much expertise to do it properly. And for pig depopulation, it is a electric stunning rest uh, conveyor restrainer on a trailer. That's what I recommend. And I, I uh, you know, the University of Nebraska has uh, got information on that and that's the thing to do. They're not that expensive to build. I think we're going to have to leave it there for today, everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk and thank you, Dr. Grennan, for speaking to us. I can share my screen here.